Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start by uh, you know asking asking uh, Councilmember Espinal, you know why Brooklyn? Um, I think it became clear when we saw that a lot of what's happening is happening in Brooklyn, right? When you talk about Gotham Greens and all the other companies uh, that are operating here, they they pretty much are setting a framework on how this should look like and how this should operate um, across the city, not only the borough. Um, but you know, Brooklyn is also home to a lot of the lowest income communities in the city. And I saw this and I see this as an opportunity to expand um, healthy food options and fresh fruit and vegetables in low income neighborhoods like East New York. You know? So um, I think that uh, this is the, the way to go. You know, I think a lot of other states and cities are very fortunate to, to be able to have a true farm to fork experience. Uh, we don't have that here in New York City. And I think this is also an opportunity to make that happen. Uh, Professor Cohn, do you want to chime in? Why Brooklyn, why East New York? New York? Um, I, I want to echo those uh, comments. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, and I, I see Brooklyn as a center of innovation. And as we can see, the urban agriculture system is very diverse and extremely innovative. Innovative in high technology, but also innovative in the way uh, community organizations have uh, found ways to cultivate spaces that were left over from development projects, uh, find ways to uh, organize each other in uh, helpful fashion to, to produce food and sell it in their communities. And so uh, I, th I think Brooklyn is an ideal laboratory for urban agriculture development. Uh, so Professor Cohn, let me, let me just follow up on that. Uh, what have been some of the roadblocks? I mean, it, you know, so let's look at a neighborhood like East New York. We, we have vacant real estate that's underutilized. We have, uh, uh, we have needs for employment. There's uh, a lower tax base, so the cost of development is gonna be lower. What's preventing uh, these industries from taking off today? Um, a number of things. Uh, um, as Rosman talked about, uh, we, we need an urban agriculture plan, and not because we need uh, another agency to uh, create a master plan for this, uh, uh, incredibly diverse network, but because uh, we need coordination between agencies. Uh, uh, just the, in the last couple of years, the Housing Preservation Development Agency, which is tasked with building affordable housing throughout the city, um, in the process uh, threatened a number of community gardens. Uh, not deliberately, but because uh, gardening and farming and growing food was not part of the mission of that agency. Um, likewise, other agencies uh, like um, the New York City Housing Authority, which is innovating and creating farms. Uh, EDC, the Economic Development Corporation, which is investing in infrastructure, uh, can probably uh, do a much better job coordinating um, uh, among, uh, among, among their staff and, and, and uh, throughout the city to um, grow urban agriculture. And one other thing, uh, each neighborhood in which urban agriculture has flourished because there were neighborhoods that were disinvested in in the 1970s and 80s, are now at risk of gentrification. And so there's a risk that as the city develops, and we all want development, we all want um, the growth of affordable housing in communities, uh, that real estate won't be affordable and the spaces will be um, um, uh, traded off uh, for, for development projects. And so uh, it's really critical now that we develop a plan that says, you know, in the future we want uh, urban agriculture to be uh, a permanent part of the city, along with housing and other infrastructure that we need. That's great. Uh, I want to I want to welcome uh, I want to welcome our, our our last guest, uh, Borough President Eric Adams. Thank you for joining thank us you. today. Thank it's you. a real pleasure, and thank you for your leadership on this thank issue. You. <clears throat> uh, now, now, uh, President Adams, uh, let me just quickly ask you the question that I opened by asking Councilmember Espinel: uh, Why Brooklyn? Why why is urban agriculture good policy for Brooklyn? Uh, um, I, I think that, and I, and I say over and over again. Um, uh, there's two types of Americans, those who live in Brooklyn, those who wish they could, and <laughs> the uh, things happen in Brooklyn uh, more than a tree grows in Brooklyn. And there's, um, there's this synergy and energy that um, Brooklyn has become this magnet of creativity. And uh, there's great opportunities uh, to uh, really deal with the, uh, the conversation around um, urban agri agriculture. And you have um, just a, a huge champion and um, out the councilman 
And you know, we're looking forward. You know, not only must we have fertile soil to grow things, you must have fertile mind to be receptive uh, to what the possibilities are. A lot of great ideas have turned into weeds because you had bad farmers. And I think that now you have the right people in the right place to do the right things in the right borough. And Brooklyn is the place to make it happen. All right, so, so just to follow up on that and to, and to bring Council Member Espinal into the conversation, what do the initiatives look like that both of your offices are working on? How are you collaborating uh, and how are you running uh, concerted efforts uh, in, in concert? Yeah, well, in, in East New York, uh, we just went through a major rezoning. And I remember the, in the earlier talks of that rezoning, um, there were these ideas that were, that were sprouting up of, you know, how can we create rooftop farms and, and use those rooftop farms to not only produce food for the local community, but also uh, be a space where you'll have the overall manufacturing and, and the shipping out to other neighbors and creating those local jobs. Um, but it, it never came to fruition, and I was very disappointed by that. But what I've been doing uh, in, through the process is every time a developer comes in to, to meet with me and talk about their plans, for what the building will look like, I always push for us to have a rooftop farm. And for the most part, two out of the two buildings that have come to me have pretty much committed to having rooftop urban gardening in their buildings. So, you know, it, it's, it's important that we continue pushing that message. And I think at the end of the day, we cannot continue to just treating it like spot, like spot by spot, right? We have to find a way where we can come together and create a larger, broader plan and how we can create a framework that would benefit the entire city. Uh, Borough President Adams in that time also expresses interest. So we became like like soulmates in that way, right? We, we, we were like, well, you, you know. That's um, why we passed marriage equality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was really excited to know that a borough wide elected official, you know, not only a borough wide elected official, but someone from Brooklyn, uh, had the same passions as I have. Uh, and we've seen his eating habits change over the past few years. You know, he he's been doing a, a great job in changing his diet and, and making sure that he's one of the healthiest Brooklynites mm -hmm. in our borough. Um, so he, this is personal to him as well. So. This really became an organic relationship, and um, I think that our offices have been working not only with each other, but with the stakeholders in figuring out what that plan will look like and how we can really push that forward and make it something real. Uh, Professor Cohen, um, I want to go back to something that uh, Ben from Eden Works was discussing in terms of developing a uh, system by which we can rate the success of urban farming. Uh, what would those metrics look like, and how would that best be implemented? Uh, well, we began to develop them in the Fiber Farm Project, as Rosamond uh, uh, talked about. But um, I think we need to uh, both track the, um, the operation of these farms. We need to understand the environmental and, and health consequences of, of these farms, because they're um, opportunities to maximize the environmental gains from urban agriculture. Um, uh, one of the speakers mentioned the, the idea of, of capturing stormwater. That's a big problem in New York City, and we have a, a large green infrastructure program. That program can be uh, tailored to support urban agriculture as a green infrastructure in the city, and essentially solve two problems at once. Uh, food production, fresh fruit production, uh, three problems, job creation <laughs> and um, stormwater retention. And so um, measuring those the, those outcomes of urban agriculture is really critical. And I want to mention, I, I, I'm not promoting my book, but I just want to uh, mention that uh, in this book, Beyond the Kale, which emerged from the Fiber or Farm Project, my colleague Kristen Reynolds and I um, profiled farms and gardens throughout the city, including East New York farms, that are using their spaces and their activities for social justice to uh, really deal with uh, race and class and gender oppression. And that's an important metric that's a little bit harder to measure, but um, no less important than actually um, you know, growing uh, produce. Uh, wh where in the five boroughs do we see the most sophisticated, sophisticated application of, of urban farming today? I think that we, we're making some great strides um, here uh, in the borough. Um, I, I, put, I think I put approximately um, $2.5 million uh, into some of the um, uh, agricultural uh, research and development. Uh, and what we're doing in schools, uh, a large portion of my capital dollars is going into schools and encouraging um, uh, a whole philosophy around um, from soil to plate. And I, I just think that a lot of people just don't get it. They, 
you know, that old commercial that used to say that um, this is not your dad's Oldsmobile, the new Oldsmobile. This is not your dad's um, little farm in the backyard where you, you're going to grow a tomato here or there or some um, celery or, or carrots. No. The possibilities and the potential of what we can do can revolutionize um, the food industry. Uh, and so when people do an analysis of, of uh, urban farming, they basically just look at that one piece of it. They don't look at um, the impact of trucks off our roads that are coming from the upstate area. They don't look at the health significance and the, uh, the new um, uh, medical research that connects um, nutritional mental health that children who are not getting the right food are unable to compete competitively. That's why you go around public housing and you see a lot of um, antisocial behavior from some of the young students because when you look there, they only have junk food. Park Slope has whole food. Over there, they have junk food and they can't compete. Look at my reversal in diabetes. I was diagnosed with diabetes and, 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 and um, doctors want to put me on medicine. And I went to see a doctor in Ohio. A doctor in Ohio said, change your diet. I changed my diet in three months. They cannot find the diabetes in my body because of what I ate. Food. It's the power of food. And the disconnect of food. And so when, when um, city professionals, as professional bureaucrats, look and say it is not profitable to do what we want to do, um, it's because they're looking through a myoptic lens. It is, it, we cannot do this as an option. If we want to reverse um, the health care, we want to reverse the lack of quality food, if we want to be proactive in leading um, the globe, we are so far behind the globe. The globe is leading us on the possibilities, all this roof space we have, that we can really have real ways of addressing some of the food desert. And I think some of the problems that I believe is that some of the policy makers can walk outside their door and get the quality food that they're looking for anytime. But when you go to Brownsville and you have to get wilted lettuce and you can't find um, any um, good fruits and vegetables. And when you go through East New York and um, you can't find that quality food, there's not a feeling of urgency. When you can just go right down to Court Street and go into Trader Joe's and pick the food you want and, you know, everything is fine, there's no urgency. And I know the urgency because I know what food is, is, is doing to people and how we must push this forward. So one thing that we want to do, um, I'm, I want to put up a uh, million dollars to create an urban agriculture culture incubator space where we can get all of these great minds into one building. I don't want my hydroponic researchers to be in the building where people are making chairs or they're making uh, the new widget. I want them all to be together, that synergy in one building to exchange and cross-pollinate ideas. Uh, the city must be a part of this. We need one structure, one building to use R&D in the city, to use new technology, uh, and how do we continue to expand some of the great things that are being done to already that scattered out on the top of a, uh, a roof in Williamsburg, in someone's basement in Park Slope, uh, in some um, home, someone's kitchen in um, Cobble Hill. No, let's bring all of these great minds together, build a pipeline where young people can start learning the industry and the technology that is sustainable to do this and actually be ready for the new jobs that are coming on market because the jobs are going to be here and our young people are not going to be prepared because we're not building the infrastructure. Woo. All right, well, well, I want to I want to thank you for that. I can't think of a I can't think of a better segue to introduce Tatiana Polowski. Uh, Cube Fellow, uh, 2017 class here at the law school, uh, who's going to um, present a, a short summary of her white paper entitled, uh, <coughs> Food Deserts to Just Desserts. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Tatiana Polowski, and I'll be presenting some of my paper highlights on building urban ag policy in New York City. Um, as a side note, I'll be attempting to cram 70 pages worth of paper into about 10 minutes of speaking, so let's see how far I can get. Um, as we've heard from our speakers tonight, um, urban ag comes in many forms, and it's a topic of increased importance for local business and government. Um, just touching on some more of what uh, the borough president just spoke about, um, I'll be really focusing on why urban ag is important for our city's lower income communities and how taking a page from the playbooks of other cities to expand urban ag policies will help ensure that all New Yorkers have better access to fresh food. Uh, first, let's take a look at where we stand today. Um, as we've heard, New York is uh, pretty amazing um, as far as what it does already. Uh, we have the biggest urban ag system in the country, actually. Um, the mayor's office has dedicated city resources and provided tax incentives for energy conservation, preserving green space, and aiding the health and wellness of New Yorkers. Um, as Rosemont mentioned, we have um, just about 600 community gardens, and most of them do um, have fresh produce. Um, and we have many high-tech urban ag businesses like rooftop and vertical farms. Um, also, a really great component of our city is that uh, we have a great school greenhouse program uh, that teaches students about how food grows and how produce is key to nutrition. On the other hand, the system needs work. One big issue, as has been discussed, is that New York has a huge economic disparity with wealth concentrated in a few places and large pockets of lower income neighborhoods scattered across Manhattan and the outer boroughs. This results in the food desert phenomenon. Uh, low income neighborhoods where access to fresh produce is limited due to a lack of grocery stores, farmers markets, and healthy food providers. The USDA defines low access as when a substantial portion of a community's population lives farther than half a mile from the nearest supermarket. This 2015 USDA food access map shows the concentration of low income blocks shaded in blue and low access food desert areas in green. As we can see, one of the biggest food desert examples here in Brooklyn is clustered in Brownsville, Canarsie, and East New York. Let's consider now what typical families in these neighborhoods actually face. Imagine a family with school aged children in East New York where the average income is just north of 39,000, the nearest supermarket is a 20 minute walk, while the nearest bodega is half a block away. The problem, of course, is that your typical corner store doesn't really sell a lot of fresh produce. Farmers markets in the area do offer healthier options, but their locations and hours are limited, and the reality of feeding a family with kids often means opting for convenience and value over more expensive and healthy choices. Elderly and disabled people face similar food access problems. Walking half a mile to a supermarket to buy fresh produce is a genuine hardship. We need to do more to feed our most vulnerable citizens. A second issue that New York faces, um, as Henry mentioned, is the very high value of land. When applied to the current urban ag framework, this dictates how locally grown produce enters the stream of commerce. To turn a profit, large scale urban farms must take the cost of city rent and taxes into account when building their business models. This results in two things, maximizing crop yields in limited space and selling quality goods at a premium to ensure that adequate profit margins are met. In practical terms, this means that too often, urban farms can't afford selling their products in lower income communities, and in turn, lower income communities can't afford to reap the benefits of this locally available and produced food. So, in light of these challenges, the two principal goals of expanding urban ag policy in New York, as I view them, are increasing availability of fresh and affordable produce in every neighborhood of the city, and giving urban farmers more options to utilize the city's limited space to meet their profit margins. Luckily, these goals are not mutually exclusive and can be met with one comprehensive plan that one, addresses the nutritional needs of all individuals, including our most vulnerable citizens, two, empowers local communities by providing for more urban ag opportunities, and three, bolsters the innovative options of cutting edge urban farmers to continue building efficient vertical farms. The major le legislative component of this plan that can meet all three of these elements is amending our zoning code. As it stands, our zoning code allows community gardens in all zones and rooftop farming in light industrial and commercial zones. However, most uses in residential zones, including rooftop greenhouses, are much more restricted. The code prohibits rooftop greenhouses in residential zones on top of buildings where people sleep, and it prohibits growing and selling produce on the same tax lot. Also, the zoning code has not fully addressed the potential of the rooftop farming model and is altogether silent on the concept of indoor vertical farming. This is significant given the large amount of vacant buildings and underused indoor space, such as in basements. The practical result here is that in residential zones, produce cannot be grown inside or on top of many buildings. 
This directly impacts the physical health of lower income New Yorkers, as well as the financial health of smaller scale urban farmers. Before we discuss what New York should do, let's see what other cities have done to expand their urban ag policies. Indeed, zoning code revisions have played a key role in expanding urban ag in many cities. For example, Baltimore created agricultural overlay districts. Pittsburgh amended its zoning codes twice in five years to permit urban ag in all districts, either as a primary or an accessory use. And Denver wrote specific urban ag uses into its zoning code to expand what is permissible in each district. Some cities did much, much more than this. Let's look at Boston, which was one of the case studies of the three that I did in my paper. The city's need and desire for more local food led its mayor to establish an Office of Food Initiatives in 2010. After settling several goals to strengthen the food economy, the city consulted with a number of experts, used a USDA grant to commission a feasibility study, and developed a very, very detailed five-year vision plan. After three years of research and planning, Boston passed a detailed zoning code amendment, which itemized a number of urban ag use categories, expanded permissible uses in various zoning districts for rooftop farming and other urban ag activities, and set forth a clear application and approval process for each proposed use. These amendments were summarized into a layman's user guide to help everyday citizens figure out how to get started with their urban ag projects. A local developer also made a mobile app called Fathom that provides guidance on zoning and urban ag options in Boston. Throughout all these actions, Boston kept all of its food policy related programs and initiatives organized under the OFI umbrella with a streamlined website containing information that's easy to read and access on the city's urban ag programs and resources. In other words, Boston is a great example of a comprehensive plan being successfully created and implemented. But if Boston can do this, then so can New York City. So let's discuss what urban ag expansion in New York ought to look like. First, let's note that we're not starting from scratch since our city already has several plans in place, as we've heard, in support of urban agriculture, including the city council's food, food works vision plan and the mayor's one NYC plan. Still, what's missing is a truly comprehensive plan that covers all aspects of food policy promotion and expansion. This plan should include a few key elements. First, the plan should streamline our city's current system of several offices dealing with sustainability, <coughs> food metrics, and green initiatives, as it's neither efficient nor sufficient. We should either create one office that covers all policies pertaining to urban ag, such as an urban ag czar or ombudsman, or at least establish a consortium of offices and agencies under an urban ag umbrella so that all groups dealing with urban ag policy aspect goals stay coordinated. Second, the plan should adopt and promote the policies of each of these offices and align itself with the goals and benchmarks of the existing sustainability plans already in place. Accountability measures should also be inserted into this plan to ensure follow through. Third, the plan should endeavor to amend the zoning code by defining urban agriculture as a term, clearly itemizing allowable uses, expanding what is allowable in each zone, and reconsider some of the existing restrictions, such as the sale and greenhouse restrictions in residential zones. The zoning code should also clearly define indoor farming and consider making basement farming allowable in residential zones to allow for more food production. Fourth, the plan should focus on creating a single mechanism, such as a well-organized website, for providing city residents with clear and easy to understand information in one place about what types of uses are allowable and what processes must be followed for someone who wants to grow their own food in the city. Fifth, the city has a big need for centralized and comprehensive databases to track urban agriculture projects and food production outputs. Some of this data is already out there, but it should be better centralized. The plan should incorporate existing land use data and assertive feasibility studies in developing borough specific policy goals for how urban ag projects could best be promoted and developed since all boroughs have their own economic needs and capacities. Finally, the plan should encourage investment and development in the urban ag industry by expanding the availability of tax, energy, and other incentives to new and existing businesses. So what will all this accomplish, and how will this affect our communities? Relaxing zoning restrictions and centralizing information on when urban ag options are available and allowable will empower individuals, as well as their communities, to grow their own food, whether in their basements or on their roofs. This will mean better food access in previously underserved areas. Businesses and investors will also profit and benefit as they will have more options to establish their urban ag projects in additional zoning districts and in new and innovative ways. If some of these approaches tend to be, uh, turn out to be more cost effective, then businesses may eventually have the opportunity to expand their market reach by passing their cost savings to lower income customers and selling in lower income areas. So our two big takeaways from an urban ag policy plan are that one, Individuals will have the tools to strengthen their local food economy and their communities. And two, urban ag businesses will have the flexibility to contribute to the larger food economy in new ways by reinvesting in previously underused infrastructure. 
Our city has the motivation, the tools, and the infrastructure to make this plan happen and should seize this amazing opportunity to make our vibrant urban ag system better for everyone. Now, before we move to Q&A, I just want to take a moment to thank my independent study advisor and CUBE De uh, Deputy Director, Professor Debbie Bechtel, um, whose guidance and support over the course of the last year has really made this research project possible. Um, also, big thanks to John Rudikoff and Paul Gangzi, uh, respectively our current uh, and former CUBE directors, um, who have done incredible things with the center over the last four years. Um, I've been involved with CUBE since its inception, and it's been one of the best experiences of my law school career. Um, and lastly, I want to thank everybody who is here on this panel uh, tonight because literally your work has served as a direct inspiration for my paper in each of the sections. Um, each speaker here has made a unique contribution toward promoting sustainable urban ag policy in, in this great city. So thank you all very much. All right. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone for their patience. I think we can do about uh, maybe, maybe five minutes. Five, five to seven minutes of Q and A. Uh, so, we have a question back there. Do we have someone with a microphone? Hello, I'm Mary. I'm a BLS alum, and I have a, sort of a two-part question about the overall vision and sustainability of this movement. One is: Is there sort of an overarching goal for what percentage of food do we want to see grown in the five boroughs that's in? a low-income New Yorker's diet, for example. And two is, have you looked at sort of the sustainability of indoor farming when you need sort of to daylight that building? And is that really offset carbon that would maybe be used on gasoline from a truck where it's like 90 miles away, which is sort of, I think, the working definition of local. So. Is local really more sustainable when you're lighting up a building versus using permaculture practices within sort of a very drivable radius? Just a couple of responses. Um, we'll never feed the entire city growing food in New York City. It's impossible. But urban agriculture can contribute to uh, improving nutritional health in uh, communities because people can grow fresh fruits and vegetables uh, that are essential for reducing non-communicable diseases in, in, in the city. Um, to your point about the energy balance, we need to do more research. And I think Brooklyn could, um, with an incubator project, uh, could be the center of innovation, technological innovation that would reduce the energy usage of indoor agriculture. But you're right, we need to look at, and, and, and we've discussed those trade-offs. Um, those are really important to, to analyze. It, it, it's equally important uh, to develop the infrastructure to make farming within the region more uh, mm -hmm. profitable. Uh, and that includes you know, processing infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, and so those investments are equally important as urban agriculture infrastructure. James Allen, I'm a student here. Could you talk a little bit more about eating habits, especially uh, how we can get urban agriculture into schools so we can try to change the eating habits of some of our New York City residents? Okay, so um, this is actually something that uh, Mayor de Blasio um, has already embraced. Um, one of the big developments, as I briefly mentioned, is that uh, we have um, greenhouses on top of uh, school buildings. And one of the really nice benefits of that is that students not only learn where food comes from, um, but they also learn about the value of nutrition. Um, they learn that at a young age. Uh, and the best part about these programs is that when the food is grown, it actually ends up in the school cafeterias, so they're actually eating the food that they're growing from a young age. Um, and the mayor has partnered with uh, Sunworks um, to basically keep installing greenhouses on top of school buildings, you know, all over the city. Uh, so the idea is that the more we integrate this into our public school programs and systems, the the better the likelihood that that children are going to learn the value of nutrition in the process and so that from a young age. In addition to that, um, what we found is that particularly here in the borough of Brooklyn, um, where 47 percent of Brooklyn I speak a language other than English at home, so uh, much of what um, parents learn come from their English-speaking students that come home and inform them. 
And so we start allowing children, particularly those who come from first generation uh, Americans, they'll tell you the child really communicates to the family and really steer them in the right direction. Um, there's a disconnect between our desire of creating healthy eating habits and what we do. We had a debate over what type of pizza we should serve children in school. Pizza is one of the number one reasons for, for obese childhood obesity. When you look at the unhealthy food that is being served to our children, and then we talk about uh, we need to deal with some of the indicators that are having unhealthy practice, there's a disconnect. When we educate them to see where, where food comes from, how it um, enhances their ability to learn, some of the schools where they have a vegetarian uh, a diet in the school, behavior problems have improved, the uh, a young person's ability to comprehend information. This is all factual um, uh, research and data that shows the clear connection between a healthy diet and ensuring that uh, young people are learning how to um, not only learn how to eat healthy inside the school building, but to take it out and share it with, with their family. So there's a clear disconnect. People have not really bought on, bought on to the real research that shows the overall advantage of allowing someone to have a full, healthy education around food and to improve their quality of life. I would just add that there are also, uh, in addition to the greenhouses, a lot of really great um, uh, soil-based farms around the city that are doing um, some uh, yum and yuck exercises with, with kids. So um, they try and change their attitudes about the foods by getting them working in the farm. So they actually, they measure whether they think something is, is yummy or yucky, like at the beginning of this program, and then they go and do and have, you know, they garden and have fun and they're out there and then at the end they try it again and it's amazing how many attitudes change just by being part of right. that farming exercise. Right. Uh, I just want to mention an exciting uh, relatively new pr project at, at, at NYCHA. Um, the farms at NYCHA are um, large-scale farms. Uh, David Vigil and, and East New York Farms is a community partner for uh, Bayview Houses. Howard Houses has a farm and Red Hook West has a farm. And uh, these aren't, again, designed to produce enough food for the development, but they're really designed as a way to introduce the residents to right. fresh produce right. and to run educational programming at the farm and to continually expose people to the idea that fresh vegetables are just an important part of our lives. And um, uh, even though they're, um, again, not producing a huge amount of food, they're producing enough food to distribute it to enough residents that we hope and we're measuring this. We hope that the um, the attitudes and eating habits are going to change. That's so important, and that's just so important, you know, on what what you just stated. Because oftentimes we we we're looking at the wrong indicator. We're saying, well, you know what? That's not enough to feed the whole community. We have to change mindsets. There are communities that we travel through that throughout their week they have no fruits or vegetables in their entire diet. None at all. They believe the closest thing to a fresh vegetable is the ketchup on their hamburger. And that's the reality. When you, and and, and if, if you cannot sustain your body, if all you eat is processed food, and even the processed food is no longer real, real food. McDonald's makes a, uh, a, a red sludge hamburger. That's not even real hamburger meat. And so if we don't change mindset, if we don't start people understanding why it's important to have quality nutritional food, then we are in, into, uh, we're moving into a health care crisis. We're, we're near. The map that was shown where the food deserts are, look at the mapping of that. Do a GIS mapping, and you'll also find that's the same level where you have low performance in school, high crime, high health indicators, um, homelessness. It's the same problem that's coming, and it all goes back to the food. The food you put in your body is going to impact who you are as a human being, and that needs to be understood. And if we don't get that part of it, we're never going to fully understand why this fight is so important, what we're trying to accomplish. 
I think we have. Uh, I think we have time for for one more question. Uh, maybe right here. Hi, my name is Wiley Goodman, and I'm a graduate student at uh, Cornell, um, and I've been working with the hydroponic program up there as well as um, with Cornell University Cooperative Extension here in New York with um, Philson Warner, who you may know, uh, Borough President Adams, who's uh, done a lot of work. He's one of the, the really forerunners of uh, doing aquaponics and hydroponics in schools here. I'm not here to promote him. Um, that's just background. However, um, I'm writing my thesis interestingly, and think, thank you so much for your amazing work. It's incredible. Um, looking at teens who are, who are, who are being uh, educated, again, through programs like SunWorks, Teens for Food Justice, uh, Cornell programs, in these, uh, in these programs, and I'm a total advocate, so I, I'm going to ask a bit, a bit of a controversial question here, but I, and I'm a supporter, but I'm also a, little, a bit of a skeptic. Um, and my skepticism comes from the fact that, you know, teens um, want to go out in the world and they want to make money and they want to have good paying jobs. And a lot of the work that, um, that I think they're being trained for right now, I mean, the reality is for commercial enterprises, certainly, um, a lot more to be scalable, to be profitable, uh, things have to be automated. You, you have to get workers, uh, certainly the, the harvesting people, out of the system to go into automation. So the jobs that we really want to train these low-income kids for should be the STEM careers, right? All the mostly white people who are starting businesses, who are uh, entrepreneurs, who are, have uh, degrees in, um, in engineering, in design, uh, in uh, software development, how do we, I think there needs to be a better pipeline, not just for getting kids with their hands in the lettuce, which I think is great for the food part, but in order to have well-paying jobs, not just harvesting jobs, but well-paying jobs in this industry, we have to create a better pipeline between the commercial enterprises that are starting in the city and getting uh, internships and other opportunities for these kids to be mentored, to think about this profession in a way that helps them really uh, have, you know, <laughs> six-figure salaries instead of uh, working-class salaries. Thank you. And, and, and what you said is so important, and I, and I, and I really want you to uh, understand um, um, what I feel about what you're saying because it's important. Many young people, and I have a 21-year-old uh, that's just graduated from um, college, and I finally have money again. Thank God. <laughs> uh, um, Many young people of color believe the food thing is a white person thing. You know, that is not our thing. When we change their mindset that healthy is a human thing and not a color thing, and once they break free of that those barriers, those psychological barriers that believe there's only certain things they can do and can't do. If they start farming and growing, there was a graduation class at Borough Hall of a group of young people um, who came from public housing, who learn how to farm and learn how to grow things. And the confidence that those young people had they were then now talking about they want to go to uh, Ivy League schools and, and learn more. They broke free from believing that not only, I don't want them just to grow up to know how to grow lettuce, but if they break free from the, um, the universe that they can only be in, there's no black part of the globe or white part of the globe, there is a globe. And when you start doing things outside of what others have told you are your own boundaries because of your ethnicity or your gender, then you find yourself falling into that. So this is so much more than um, we want to give you a job as a farmer or to pick apples. No, we want to break them free that if you learn how to plant a seed and grow food that can feed your mother who's on metformin because of diabetes and take her off of diabetes, now you can start being a doc, thinking about being a doctor. If you can figure out how to feed your housing development with what you have grown, now you can talk about opening um, stores in your community to replace the bodegas that are just selling useless food. No, there's a great opportunity of having young people grow, break free from the limitations of what they can't be and see what they can be. That's what this is about. And when I see these young people growing from these programs, 
of farming, when I look at some of the stuff you guys are doing, the young people see their possibility, they start having conversations that's far beyond, beyond just growing food. They're different human beings. Reconnecting people with nature is going to reconnect them with their possibilities of what they can become. This is a major issue. That's why I'm so passionate about it. My A1C was a 17. I should have been in a coma. In three months, because I embraced food, healthy food, and got rid of processed food, they couldn't find diabetes. Now my mother's on my program, has been injecting herself for 15 years with insulin, and she's going to be off insulin. Food heals us, and that is why I'm so comp compassionate about this issue. We have to deal with the food that is killing us every day. Well, uh, I, I certainly can't think of a, of a better way to, to wrap up our panel and evening. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank all of you uh, for bearing with us and participating in this event. So thanks very much. I uh, hope to see you all at future events.